Okay, everybody, the moment you've all been waiting for. Here is Brad Cook and his talk on how psychedelics affect the mind from a neuroscience perspective. Thank you all for coming here. We are so excited to have you. Much love. I understand. Okay. Thank you, Paul. It's a real privilege and honor to speak to you today, and I really appreciate your attention. I've been a neuroscientist and a professor of neuroscience and psychology for over 20 years, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to share with you this new theory about consciousness and how psychedelics influence our consciousness. So this talk is gonna be as much about the brain and consciousness as it is about psychedelic drugs which influence consciousness, obviously. Um, so for, if you want to look this up later, I'll be talking about what's called the predictive processing model of brain function. And I look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions or need clarification. <clears throat> so to begin, <clears throat> I'd like to share with you something that was developed at Johns Hopkins University called the Mystical Experience Checklist. And this was designed as one of their objective tools to assess whether a subject is having a psychedelic experience. And after the trial has ended, if a subject endorses any number of these statements, then they can conclude that the subject has had a psychedelic experience. And so just to read a few of these, uh, to give you a sense, they include a sense of reverence, an awareness of um, the life and living presence of all things, a feeling that one experienced something profoundly sacred and holy. I'm not gonna read all of them, but hopefully you can and will get a sense, if you haven't had, the, had such an experience yourself, of something about what it is like to take a powerful psychedelic drug like psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. <clears throat> the next slide is another bit of data, also from Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> And in this study, uh, subjects at Johns Hopkins received uh, either psilocybin or placebo, which in this case was Ritalin. And at the conclusion of the experience, after a, a powerful five to six hour long journey, uh, they were asked a series of questions. And one of them was, how personally meaningful was the experience to you? And the black bars indicate those subjects who received the psilocybin, and the white bars indicate those that receive the active placebo, which again was Ritalin. And it shows the percentage of volunteers who endorse the statement that these were some of the most personally meaningful experiences in their life. As you can see, psilocybin elicited for most of the participants one of the top five most meaningful experiences in their entire life. And so this, to me, is compelling evidence that psychedelics, particularly the tryptamine and phenethylamine-based psychedelics, which, about which I'll be talking, produce a beneficial and profoundly powerful experience in our minds. And so my task today is to try to convey to you a little bit about, about how the brain itself works and then how the brain works under the influence of a psychedelic. The fundamental question that I'll tackle at first is about sensory perception. How do we perceive with our eyes or any of our senses something out there in the world, okay? For example, all of you are listening to me, perceiving me with your eyes and your visual sense. You're hearing me as well. But for the sake of this example, let's pretend we're looking at an apple, okay? We're all just gazing at an apple in our hands. My task today is to try to show you how that might work in the brain. So we're gonna begin with a little Cook's tour of the brain and how it works. And to begin this, I want to, um, postulate or tell you something, which is that inside each one of our heads, it is dark, okay? It's dark in there, there's no light. And yet, almost miraculously, our brains produce or generate light. We're in a brightly lit room, and yet it's dark inside of our heads. How does the brain generate perception? Okay, so this is a schematic of the human brain as seen from the right side. And the bottom line here is that location is equivalent to function in the human brain. If you look carefully at the labels, you see that different senses are shown. On the far left of the figure is the visual cortex, 
And next to it is the visual association area. In the middle of the schematic is the auditory cortex, and next to that is the auditory association area. Each one of our senses, vision, hearing, touch, smell, proprioception, and interoception has a distinct location in the brain. The surface of the brain that we're seeing right now is called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is very thin. It's only about a millimeter, but it is absolutely essential for conscious perception, for understanding and knowing what it is you're looking at. The second thing I want you to notice about this schematic is that the three sensory areas that are shown there have both a primary area and an association area. Okay? So on the left, there's the visual cortex, and adjacent to it is the visual association area. And this highlights another important feature of uh, perception, which is that our sensory areas have work in a hierarchical manner. That is, they begin by detecting simple features and then construct more complex perceptions the further away you go. So in the case of an apple, the primary visual cortex, which is near the back of the brain, is perceiving or sensing the color red, the curvature of the apple, its reflectance, and then those features are gradually built up into a more complex perception until we finally recognize the object as an apple. And importantly, every sense that we have has the same hierarchy from simple to more complex. Okay, a bit of anatomy now. Um, on the left side of the picture is a cross section of the human brain. You can see the gray matter and the white matter. Now, if we were to take a, an imaginary microscope and peer into the gray matter which covers the surface of the brain, we would see something like the illustration on the right. That is a drawing of the cellular constituents of the cerebral cortex. The objects shown in black are the neurons. Those are cells which constitute the cerebral cortex and the rest of the brain. Importantly, the brain, uh, excuse me, the cerebral cortex has six layers, six layers throughout its entire surface. <clears throat> Again, with our mi imaginary microscope, um, we can zoom in now a little bit closer and look at the cellular arrangements within the cerebral cortex. This is an illustration of a few neurons within the cortex. Neurons, illustrated here, are beautiful microscopic trees that have slender branches that um, make connections with other neurons. The branches we're looking at are called dendrites. And on the dendrites are specialized connections called synapses. In this illustration, the dendrites in one neuron are shown in pink. And then the process that connects to those dendrites called the axon is shown in black. Neurons communicate with each other via synapses using a specialized language that we call neurotransmitters. Okay, and neurotransmitters are going to be an important role in this story. Now, zooming in even further with our imaginary microscope, <clears throat> I've provided an illustration of the synaptic connection between two neurons. The illustration here shows the so-called presynaptic neuron in blue and the postsynaptic neuron in pink. As some of you may know, neurons communicate via electrical signals that are called action potentials. The action potential travels down the axon and causes the axon terminal to release tiny little puffs of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. That chemical diffuses across the synaptic cleft to bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell, where those receptors in turn induce an electrical change in the postsynaptic cell. And in this way, the electrical, um, excuse me, the neuronal communication is electrical, chemical, and then electrical again. So signals are passed in a chemical manner but the neurons themselves are electrical. One of the neurotransmitters that we have in our brains that's very important is called serotonin, or 5-HT. And serotonin is very important for the story about psychedelics because it is um, the neurotransmitter to which these chemicals most resemble, most closely resemble. So serotonin is really at the center of the story of psychedelics and psychotherapy, which is another major topic today. Okay, so moving back to the cortex, this, 
so zooming out a little bit now, uh, if we look at a, a cerebral cortex in a more macroscopic sense, we see that in addition to the six layers, there are also columns of cells. On the left-hand side of the illustration is an example of that. Columns have uh, 100 to 120 neurons, and they seem to have the same pattern of connections within each of them. Regardless of where you are in the cerebral cortex, they have the same basic set of connections. Neuroscientists think about these columns as something like little computers, because they take in the same, inf they take in information, transform it in some way, and spit an output out. So again, a little bit like computers, these columns. Input, transformation, output. And the process is the same regardless of where you are in the cerebral cortex. So again, we have six layers of cells and columns that go across. OK, back to the cerebral cortex. We're zooming out again. So in this picture, we see again how the different senses are contained within different areas of the cerebral cortex. Now, I want you to think about something, which is how each of our senses, whether it's vision, hearing, taste, or smell, has a distinct surface on the body that receives in energy from the outside world. Take the tongue, for example. Okay, the tongue is about this big inside of our mouths, and it has specialized receptors on it that detect chemical energy in the form of sweetness or bitterness or fat or whatever, right? Likewise, too, the retina. The retina is a bit of tissue at the back of each of our eye, and if we could somehow remove it from the eye and place it on a table, it would be a, basically think of it as a two-dimensional sheet. Okay, so again, we have a sheet on the tongue, a sheet at the back of the eye. The skin as well is like a sheet, okay? A two-dimensional sheet upon which pressure, what we call touch, can be transduced. Importantly, each one of these sheets, retina, tongue, skin, whatever, has a corresponding map in the brain. And that map has a kind of one-to-one -one relationship with the sheet on our body. So imagine the retina, okay? Think again of a small square of tissue sitting on the table. We could define an XY coordinate of that bit of tissue. And in the same way, we could find the same XY coordinate in the visual cortex that corresponds to that bit of retina. All right? So this is a principle that's universal in the brain, that of a mapping between the outside world and the inside world, or a mapping between the surface on the body and somewhere uh, a tissue in the brain. <clears throat> now, just as we have maps that transduce sent, uh, energy from the outside world, we also have maps that transduce um, our internal world. Um, for example, we have maps that represent the position of our joints and our muscular contraction, the amount of glucose in our blood, and the amount of fat in our body, the position of each one of our joints, and so forth. Each one of these um, bits of information is represented in its own particular area in the brain. These maps that represent the internal body are responsible for what I would call a sense of embodiment, a sense of having a body, right? So um, embodiment is the persistent experience of having a body. And we are conscious of our senses, both the internal world and the external world. And so uh, researchers have recently identified a neural network that they call the default mode network, or DMN, that seems to integrate those internal worlds and external worlds. So in this picture, what you see is a functional brain imaging result of a subject who is asked to reflect upon an, a personal experience that they had had, to sort of reflect upon what it felt like. And as you can see, there's a distinct set of areas that were activated by this. And scientists believe that this so-called default mode network is responsible for the integration of the internal world and the external world. <clears throat> Likewise, I should mention that we have emotions, right? Sadness, happiness, anger, and so forth. These result in feelings from our body. And those feelings are represented, likewise, in maps, OK? And so also, those two contribute to the sense of having a body. Now, this talk is about psychedelics. And so I'd like to mention 
one of the most reliable effects of psychedelic drugs like psilocybin or LSD is a sense of depersonalization or ego loss. And not surprisingly, given what I just said, that experience is reliably correlated with a loss of activity or a reduction in activity in the default mode network, as shown by this figure. So to summarize, I've shown you that we have maps that represent the external world, and maps that represent the internal world, and that those are integrated in the brain to produce a sense of our self. So now we return to the question of conscious perception. How, how do we become aware of that apple that we're gazing at in our hand? Well, to uh, answer this question, I'm going to provide you with a metaphor, um, of a way of thinking about what's going on. And of course, it's metaphorical, not meant to be taken literally. And so I'm going to use the visual analogy of a staircase to think about visual perception. So we have the eye where the light enters the brain and the optic nerve shown in yellow and a staircase meant to represent the visual, uh, visual cortex. This represents an intuitive but very wrong idea about brain function, which is that the information enters the mind and forms images. Um, there's a variety of reasons why this is wrong and I'll share those in a moment, but if you think for a second, this perspective begs the question, which is who or what is viewing the image. Moreover, the anatomy tells a different story. When we look at the pattern of connections within the visual cortex, we see just as many connections going from those association areas back to the primary visual cortex as there are those that go from the primary visual cortex. In other words, the visual cortex and every other sensory area has a bi-directional connections in it. So if the anatomy is bi-directional, oh, this is a cartoon meant to illustrate that question I asked you. This is kind of what's implied by an outside-in perspective on perception. It implies that there's a ghost in the machine that's viewing the images produced by the brain. But we know that's not the case. The brain generates perception. The question is, how does it do that? Well, the new idea, the one that I wish to share with you, is that um, perception is all about prediction. This new theory says that sensory perception uh, is, uh, it, the, the new theory says that uh, sensory perception is as much about prediction as it is the sensory impressions that we get from the world. This is the predictive processing model of brain function. And it says that at a fundamental level, the brain is trying to predict the pattern of sensory input while at the same time to minimize the discrepancy between prediction and the actual pattern of sensory input. Perhaps the most counterintuitive idea of this, of this model is that the content of our consciousness, the actual per like conscious perception of something like an apple, that that is the result of the discrepancy between your brain's prediction and the actual input. The content of our consciousness is the discrepancy between the prediction and the actual input. Now this particular idea is quite new but the notion that the brain is involved in prediction is more than 100 years old. So I've tried to summarize this notion with a schematic once again. And I've tried to emphasize the fact that we are isolated from the outside world. There is a boundary, an irrevocable boundary between us and the outside world. The brain is producing a model of the outside world and comparing that model to the sensory impressions that it's continuously getting. And again, the notion is that consciousness is the result of that discrepancy between the prediction and the actual input. Another implication of this idea is that perception is not direct. Perception is indirect. The world is real, but we don't perceive it directly. We generate our, our perception of it, thus it is indirect. And this has implications for psychedelics, in a, in, which I'll explain in a moment. Okay, now I want to make this a little bit more biologically realistic. And so if you recall the visual analogy of the staircase and the fact that uh, sensory processing is hierarchical, 
and that we have these columns in our cerebral cortex. I've tried to assemble all that together in one picture. So the rectangles above represent those columns, okay? And the arrows represent sensory inputs and the prediction, okay? Each one of those rectangles is a primary, sensory, primary, secondary, or tertiary sensory area. And each of those columns is simultaneously providing sensory input and predicting what the pattern of input will be. This pattern has been widely studied, and it occurs as an oscillation in the brain that occurs around 10 hertz, or 10 cycles per second. It's also called the alpha rhythm, if you know anything about EEG. And we think that this alpha rhythm is computing the difference between the sensory input and the prediction. Importantly, the brain not only tries to compute the difference, it's constantly trying to minimize that discrepancy to continuously improve the prediction. And importantly, this is a, um, uh, this is a process that's occurring subconsciously. It's not something we try to do. It is something that grows out of the way neural networks normally function. So in this picture, I've shown you the sensory inputs and what I call the prediction or the prior belief. Okay, that's gonna be the term I use from now on. Rather than prediction, it's gonna be called the prior belief. So one of the, one of the effects of this um, application of prior beliefs and sensory input can be visual illusions, a perceptual flipping that I'll show you in just a moment. There we go, thank you. Okay, so the predictive processing model of brain function has been very useful in a lot of ways, but one way is that it helps us to interpret illusions like this one, or ambiguous figures like this one, which is called the Kanaiza Triangle. We see the, the white triangle because it is our brain's prediction about what could be covering up those black circles, okay? In other words, what our brain thinks is going on is not that there's three little black Pac-Men there, but there's three whole circles that are covered up by a foreground four object. This reflects a prior belief about foreground objects obscuring background objects. Okay? Now, interestingly, people on psychedelics are much less likely to perceive this illusion. In other words, they are less likely to tell you that they see a white triangle there. What this suggests is that psychedelic drugs could be influencing those prior beliefs. They could be weakening them or relaxing them in some way. Here's a couple more examples of that. So here are other examples in which you see an object that really isn't there. And that may reflect the operation of prior beliefs on your perception. Okay, the next image I'm going to show you also reflects the acti activity of two prior beliefs that occur, that cannot occur at the same time. This is the famous duck-rabbit ambiguous figure. And most people are unable to perceive a duck and rabbit simultaneously. They see either a duck or a rabbit, but never both at the same time. So that if you could somehow keep track of when they flip in your mind consciously, that reflects the application of a prior belief, a different prior belief. Okay, so I've tried to emphasize the dynamic oscillatory process of sensory input and prior beliefs. How do psychedelics affect this oscillatory process? Well, uh, the model that I'd like to share with you says that psychedelic drugs make that psychedelic drugs relax our prior beliefs, making them less precise. So back to the visual analogy of, the, of a staircase. On the left, I've shown the sensory input with the letter S and the prediction or prior belief with the letter P. And those two are in balance with each other going up and down the staircase. If uh, psychedelics make our prior beliefs more relaxed, then that in turn will greaten the influence or increase the influence of sensory input. And with the loss of constraint upon the sort of sensory input we receive, that can increase the level of chaos or disorder in the brain. 
Okay, I'm going to have a personal moment here, a bit of water. Okay, so now I'd like to delve back into the biology, my favorite part. What do we know about how psychedelic drugs actually affect the brain? How could they change or relax prior beliefs? Tryptamine and phenethylamine-based psychedelics like psilocybin, LSD, and DMT target the serotonin 2A subtype. Uh, in the middle is a picture of the serotonin receptor, and there are cartoons of serotonin itself and uh, ergotamine, which is a compound similar to LSD. What happens when a drug activates the serotonin 2A receptor? When serotonin or a psychedelic drug activates the receptor, it in turn causes internal changes within the neuron that ultimately increase that neuron's excitability. And increased excitability means the neuron is more likely to fire action potentials, making the brain overall more excitable. Uh, we can say that this uh, greater excitability is equivalent to the brain having higher entropy, more chaos, or even a higher temperature. So the next thing we want to know is, where are serotonin 2A receptors expressed in the brain? Well, careful anatomical study has shown that serotonin 2A receptors are found in the deepest layers of the cerebral cortex, layers five and six. And they're found in those association areas of our sensory processing parts of the brain, which is precisely where you'd expect our prior beliefs to be the most influential. So this anatomical finding is consistent with the model because it indicates that they are, these serotonin 2A receptors are perfectly positioned to influence the, uh, the activity of our prior beliefs or predictions. I provided a schematic to show that. Excuse me. Right, so the purpose of this uh, schematic is to um, speculate for a moment about what the effect of relaxed prior beliefs might be on this oscillatory process. Um, importantly, prior beliefs in our normal baseline waking state are essential for normal perception. They're essential for navigating through the world by limiting the brain's freedom. For example, we have prior beliefs about foreground objects obscuring background objects. We have prior beliefs about walls and surfaces being solid. But when those prior beliefs are relaxed, we can have visual hallucinations, such as walls dripping or moving. Importantly, we also have prior beliefs about ourself, that we have a particular body that persists over time that has feelings. And when those prior beliefs are weakened, there is ego loss. Prior beliefs, we also have prior beliefs about things that we fear and our actions in the past. And when those are weakened, there can be a reconceptualization of ourself and our history. And that's the power of psychedelics for psychotherapy, which will be the final part of my talk. Okay, I'm going to continue with the visual metaphors and analogies uh, throughout this talk. So here's another one. Um, when our prior beliefs are relaxed, um, I'd like to try to explain or, or show you how that might affect the brain state as a whole. So now we're going to think about the brain as a kind of landscape, or the, the mind as a landscape, and that sometimes we get stuck in a rut, right? My, my wife offered the example of when we go visit our parents, we fall into patterns of behavior that we dislike sometimes, and yet we do it anyway, right? Those correspond in this picture to the basins of a landscape. Those are learned patterns of behavior that we repeat over and over and over again. Now, when psychedelics relax prior beliefs, that has, in this analogy, the effect of making those basins somewhat less deep, more shallow. And thus, the brain is less likely to stay in a particular rut, right? It makes the brain more, it gives it more freedom to move from one spot to another rather than being stuck in a particular basin. So again, relaxed prior beliefs, more shallow basins, more psychic freedom. This is another picture from a, this is from a research paper in which the same idea was actually um, 
demonstrated or illustrated in the following way. In most psychological research into psychedelics, subjects are put in a brain scanner and their brains are analyzed at baseline. They're given a drug, put back in the scanner, and uh, then they're compared again. And what this shows is the result of a single subject before and during a psych psychedelic experience. And what this shows is the number of different brain states that that subject could be in. On the left is at baseline, and on the right is the patterns of brain activity while the subject was on psilocybin. So I hope you understand or can see the consistency among these different analogies that I've, that I've drawn for you. That psychedelics uh, provide to the brain a bit more freedom to fall into different states. Okay, so in the final section, I want to offer some thoughts on how psychedelics can help with psychic healing. Psychedelic drugs have received the most study for their ability to relieve mood disorders like anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And so to continue with this story, I'm gonna offer yet another metaphor. So to introduce the final section, I want to uh, offer a metaphor derived from metallurgy, which is the science of uh, improving the quality of metal. So I'd like to posit that a healthy mind is one that is like a fine blade. It is sharp, resilient, and flexible. So, and people with emotional trauma, anxiety, and depression have unhealthy minds. They've been made brittle by those traumas and by their underlying predisposition. And as you all know, uh, psychedelic drugs are showing great promise in their ability to relieve these conditions. And I'd like to speak for a moment about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a powerful and profound brain injury that affects the psyche. It creates semi-permanent patterns of brain activity that include chronic anxiety, hypervigilance, and hyper heightened potentiated startle which I would consider to be analogous to brittleness, uh, like a poor metal, right? Brittleness in the face of adversity rather than resilience. People with PTSD are crippled by a dysregulated emotional control system that's been damaged by trauma, including war. Psychedelic drugs may help make their brains sharper, more flexible, and resilient by promoting the relaxation of prior beliefs about themselves. As I said, this is an analogy from metallurgy. Metallurgists know that if you have a piece of raw metal like iron, which is brittle, that you can heat up that iron and make it stronger. This is a process called annealing. You heat it up and let it cool down very slowly. What's happening at the atomic level with annealing is that the atomic bonds between those atoms of iron are getting weaker. Surprisingly, the metal becomes strong, stronger when all of the atomic bonds are at their weakest. A piece of raw metal that's very brittle has some very, very strong connections and many weak ones. So annealing, applying heat and letting it cool down slowly is a process of relaxing those uh, atomic bonds. And this is actually a very close analogy to what happens in the brain, in neural network theory actually. And some have suggested that psychedelics have an analogous effect. Excuse you. <laughs> so in this analogy, perhaps you can guess, the, the mind is the metal, right? And that the trauma is reflected in those super strong connections. The heat of psychedelics has the effect of weakening synaptic connections, redistributing connection strengths over the entire network. And in so doing, they can reform our prior beliefs about ourselves. For example, consider a veteran who has witnessed or perhaps participated in a horrific event overseas. That has led to the formation of prior beliefs about himself and his morals. With psychedelics, you can view, one can view those events from some greater remove, some emotional distance, and reform and change their conception about themselves and to do so in a way that's emotionally more uh, safe. <clears throat> so PTSD, this is not a, a common term, but I consider it a kind of brain injury by damaging those synapses in our brain. 
So I want to talk just a little bit more about the neuroscience. And to do this, I want to introduce my favorite part of the brain, which I studied for 20 years at Georgia State and Georgia Tech, uh, called the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped almond structure in the temporal lobe that is um, responsible for our emotions. And as I've illustrated here, it receives sensory input from all of our senses, vision, hearing, touch, as well as our memories. It is kind of a filter by sensing those things in the world that can cause us harm and marshalling emotional responses. Those include uh, facial expressions, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as other changes. When we have emotions, those, in, as I said, result in bodily feelings. And those bodily feelings feed back to ourself and can result in the formation of new prior beliefs. For example, in the case of PTSD, um, those prior beliefs could include the idea that a warm, sunny day with lots of smoke in the air and the sound of gunfire represents real danger. Uh, a veteran who has come home from, from war and is living in the United States does not need that prior belief anymore because he or she is in a safe environment and yet many people still have that prior. So the expectation or the hope is that psychedelic drugs and other forms of therapy can relax those prior beliefs and help people learn and reform their predictions about what the outside world actually represents. So to conclude the talk, I'm going to show a, a bit of data. Uh, this is from a, a clinical trial that part of which was conducted at Emory University. Uh, using the uh, psychedelic drug MDMA, um, also known as Molly. Here, uh, this is a veterans with PTSD were randomly assigned to re receive either placebo and psychotherapy or MDMA and psychotherapy. Uh, and at the conclusion of the study, uh, researchers evaluated how many veterans still had the symptoms of PTSD or whether they were in remission. And if you look at the red bars, that shows the veterans that received MDMA as, as well as psychotherapy. And the proportion of those veterans who were in remission was substantially and significantly greater than those who did not receive MDMA. So this was published in a very prestigious biomedical journal, Nature Medicine, and is part of the evidence that researchers are marshalling to show that MDMA should be approved as a uh, breakthrough therapy for PTSD. So we may get approval from the FDA for MDMA in the next few months. <clears throat> Lastly, I want to show you another, um, this is a graphical abstract from the New England Journal of Medicine, which might be the premier uh, biomedical journal in the United States. In this study, 59 adults with moderate to severe unipolar depression were assigned to receive either a, a placebo and a psychotherapy, excuse me, to receive a placebo and a conventional antidepressant or psilocybin. And they compared at the end of six weeks the status of those patients by the, the clinician and the patient themselves filling out a questionnaire and then concluded whether how many of them had uh, gone into remission from their depression. And so strikingly what they found is that compared to two sessions with, with psilocybin versus six weeks on a conventional antidepressant, the results were indistinguishable. So two sessions with a psychedelic, the total of which could be 12 hours, was as effective as six weeks on a conventional antidepressant. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Definitely worthy of celebration. So to summarize this section, um, I think psychedelics have, as others have said in this meeting today, have a lot of potential for psychotherapy. I think they have a new paradigm uh, complementary to the ones that we currently have. Not to replace it, but complementary to our current paradigms to help people with mood disorders and PTSD. So I would say that psychedelics can relax our prior beliefs, leading to new perspectives, and maybe reduce prediction error or uh, mis sort of mistaken priors about the outside world. Memories under the influence of psychedelics become less fraught with emotion. And after the trip, after the, the journey, with integration, those revised priors can be consolidated into new, more permanent beliefs about oneself 
and the world. So I'd like to finish up by offering some readings that you can use to learn more about psychedelic drugs. Um, they include the memoir by the discoverer of LSD, which is called My Problem Child. Michael Pollan wrote a, an immensely popular book that is, I think, in part responsible for this new renaissance of psychedelics. And then there's an article in Quanta Magazine about the predictive processing model of brain function. And finally, a, a book by Anil Seth, who uh, also uses the predictive processing model. So that's the conclusion of my talk. And before I, I stop, I want to say that if you would like to learn more about psychedelics, I have a, a card. And we can have a conversation later about that. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>